What's up everyone? Welcome back to the Maxon booth at Seagraph. I'm here with an incredible artist designer, Canadian artist and designer, Joey Camacho, also known as Raw and Rendered. And we're in a previous hometown of yours, right? We are. Vancouver yeah. is home away from home for yeah, me. Yeah, you've been showing us around some of the uh, Nice local sites, That's haven't more you? Colorful yeah. areas. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're going to be breaking down a recent brand reveal that you've been doing, which I've seen, and it's stunning. Not to oh, take away fun. your thunder. Thank you. Cool. Well, yeah. Everyone, give it up for Joey. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Um, uh, as Ellie said, my name is Joey Camacho. I go by uh, Raw and Rendered, um, and I'm just going to bring up my presentation here. So. Uh, Vancouver is my home away from home. I spent about seven years here and just moved back to Calgary uh, right when COVID started. So um, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. Um, I want to say thanks to Maxon for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've learned a lot from these types, of, uh, these types of presentations. So I'm hoping I can return the favor and hopefully give something valuable back to the community. Um, so uh, my personal work is something that I like to lean into. Uh, I kind of remove a bit of the perfection by going after progress um, on a daily basis. Um, here are a few examples of work taken from this uh, series that I started in 2014. Um, I kind of use this as a daily practice, uh, which is now in its eighth consecutive year. And um, it's just a way for me to kind of stay consistent, show up every day uh, and stay connected to kind of personal connection or personal expression and technical exploration. So um, my work tends to kind of naturally gravitate towards abstract and surreal concepts, um, mostly in technology, but also in adjacent fields. I use Cinema 4D at the core of my pipeline um, to create work that is rich with texture and light. And I strive to kind of combine art, art with my visual communications uh, kind of design principles that make makes uh, to make work that looks good and also uh, says something. So um, here's some more examples of that personal work. Um, kind of, I love particles. I love textures. I love materials. I love light. Um, and so. I've also had the pleasure of working with brands, um, you know, studios, agencies, you know, and worked on projects um, that span across all sorts of mediums. Uh, I've done, you know, experiential, in experiential installations at like, Coachella. Um, I've done commercial advertising work for companies like Nike, Under Armour, Aveda, Arcteryx, and I've worked on title sequences for um, Amazon Prime's Electric Dreams. Uh, I've done uh, work with studios on um, Star Trek's Picard, and so I, you know, use Cinema 4D at the core of everything I do. Um, and so, at the beginning of 2020, when COVID hit, that's right when we moved, and uh, it was a bit of a, a crazy time. And it can kind of be summarized with this: uh, I was, uh, it was a lot of lot going on. And I took, a, I took a bit of time to um, reflect and look back at my work and realize it was kind of an opportunity at this time to have a little bit more fun, uh, be more expressive. And you can kind of say I was like in a creative rut. I was feeling the itch to work on some new ideas, take on some new challenges and kind of get outside of my comfort zone. So that was about the time I was introduced to a company called Pixel Vault, uh, which um, it's a fantastic company. They work in the NFT kind of crypto blockchain uh, space, um, and they can be described as a uh, intellectual property development uh, group focused on elevating crypto native assets across a variety of mediums. And that is just a way of saying that um, you know they leverage the technology of, of blockchain non fungible tokens to kind of elevate you know traditional mediums like film, gaming, television, and create experiences. Um, so over the span of about six months, um, I worked with a team at Pixel Vault in an incredibly fast-paced environment, helping to create artwork for some of their, um, uh, you know, their main initiatives, brand activations, and kind of um, what we call could be like crypto product launches. So um, we created things like mint passes, um, you know, coins with and collaborations with um, Bored Apes and did uh, a bunch of gear pods, planets, you know, there was some cool Adidas collaborations in there as well. Um, and so inside of this process, they also wanted to 
uh, as they were growing, they wanted to extend their brand into uh, to, to more traditional mediums like sports, games, filming, and animation. And their brand um, needed to kind of evolve into something more simple, recognizable, uh, memorable. And I was kind of tasked with coming up with this new design. So beyond the logo itself, um, Pixel Vault needed a way to communicate this evolution in a fun and compelling way. So, so this video is kind of the, uh, the result of, 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 of that uh, process. So. So um, today I will be breaking down um, my process and some of the techniques used behind the shots. Um, we'll be using Cinema 4D uh, as the core tools and we'll adapt some complementary plugins and bridges like Ryzen UV and Substance Painter into the mix. So um, kind of uh, four parts to this presentation. There's, uh, I'm going to touch on kind of how we got to the logo and, and some of the thinking uh, that uh, I put into when we were creating the logo. Um, we'll go into a section of like lighting and rendering in Cinema 4D and compositing and After Effects, where we'll t I'll talk about takes and kind of how, how to manage multi uh, multi cam setups, and then I'll go into a procedural ish, uh, what I call procedural ish MoGraph technique. We're just using Posmore fields, cloners, and effectors um, to get our square pixel into our rounded pixel stack. And at the end, I'm going to go through kind of a, an asset customization or asset creation workflow, so you can. You can kind of take, you know, if you're in a rush and you've got assets and you've got things that you need to work with that you haven't modeled or maybe you don't have good UVs or something, you can really make a kind of ownable kit bash elements in a short amount of time. So um, the design process um, for the logo was really based in uh, the pixel itself and then play. So there was these references, you know, we've got Spaced Invaders, we've got Minecraft, we've got these things that are quite familiar to us as as people um, and you know this is a shot of the original logo with the artwork done by Chris Wall who's a, a Marvel comic book artist um, and you know he's done work for DC Comics he's just a super talented guy all around and we had this original logo which was fantastic um, but there's just some some things that kind of it fell apart at like small sizes and it, it really wasn't um, you know from a design perspective didn't kind of like do the things that needs to do across a lot of different applications so we wanted to kind of step up the game, simplify things, and, and, and really bring the design to a new level. So um, the shape language that, uh, that I started exploring with was based off some sketches. So kind of in step one, you can see, you know, just, just kind of breaking down basic shapes, extracting kind of elements, um, and, and working with uh, shape language uh, in order to see what would work. And then in stage two, kind of just dropping that in uh, to, to uh, some of the word mark, but then itself, like, uh, some of it ended up looking quite like we got X-Men, we've got things that seem really obvious, and then we've got something that looks like a, a keyboard stroke that was done incorrectly. So definitely those are the ones we tossed out, um, but there was something that seemed to start feeling a little bit more like game theory, which was this kind of like X pattern, which was the negative space of our uh, cross pattern, which is why that um, explosion in the, in the video uh, does what it does. So... Um, we started working with that and then stage three and then we're moving to stage four. We're kind of happy with using this X as is uh, in a very simplified uh, format. Now, the problem uh, with this is that the icon on itself works, or sorry, works, but only in conjunction with the word. So once we extracted that as, a, as, a, as an emblem, it, it just looked like a five squares. So it didn't work. I wasn't super happy with it. So I went back to some of the um, original uh, inspirations and started bringing in maybe elements of color and then started kind of bringing these elements of like map. And, you know, we started to develop in stage five this, this it almost looks like partly schematic, partly kind of like a heads up display element, obviously it looks like a dice, but it started getting it quite, quite a bit busy. Um, so, you know, that was like an additive process. So then when I got to stage six, I was like, okay, hey, what, what can we start to take away? So 
you know, we removed some of the pixels, kind of brought in the, the, the kind of the, 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 the walls, let's call it, um, and then started to see the fact that there was this beginning of uh, the letter P. And so in stage seven, it was really just all about refining that, that letter and really kind of like changing the shape language, again, the curvature, and really just like dialing it in. Um, and so where we ended up was uh, we've got these three components. We've got the pixel, which is the creativity at the core of everything that, that, that Pixel Vault does. Um, they've got the explorer, which is kind of like the discoverer. It's like this, this thing that, uh, you know, it's like the community. It's the people that see what's inside. And then there's the embrace, which is kind of this thing that either kind of keeps the creativity and the ideas and then lets them loose, um, or it's a place for uh, things to feel safe and included. So that's where we ended up. And these are kind of some other iterations. And we finally ended up on this final version, which was, uh, you know, a little bit more, uh, the, the font ended up being a little bit more techy and kind of supporting um, the shape language of the, of the icon itself. So that's the design process, um, just to kind of show you where we got to. Um, and here's the updated kind of application. So um, once we got out of that design phase, we quickly moved into a storyboarding phase. And this is kind of uh, quick and dirty sketches that I did in order to kind of like plot out how we, how we could assemble this new evolution of the brand so that we saw where we came from and saw to where we were ending up. And so this is those boards and then these are the frames. So some evolution happened through the process. We, you know, instead of just starting on a desk, we started in a room. Uh, instead of, you know, peeling layers off, we added kind of more technical digital layers on, which felt more appropriate. So, um, so that said, we're going to jump into cinema now that we know where we came from. Uh, this is, I'm going to break down the opening shot. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, uh, just see, uh, show you how, um, how to manage these scenes using takes, render settings, uh, AOVs, and a couple other things. So... Okay, so I'm in cinema. This is my setup. Uh, my stuff is very customized. I got a lot of stuff going on that may or may not match what you're seeing. But um, if you have any questions, uh, I'm definitely happy to answer these on how I got to this state. But um, I have my final render up here. And the reason I kept the opening shots contained in a single project file, I had, I think, three or four shots, um, is I knew feedback would come at later stages. Uh, things were being swapped out. Elements were being changed. Artwork was being changed. So. Um, I decided to avoid updating multiple shots across multiple project files. I used Cinema 4D's um, really powerful take system to create the flexibility I needed in later stages to accommodate last minute feedback. So my approach to lighting was to work backwards because I knew the lights would turn on this in this scene um, and I wanted the final lighting in the scene baked in and then I would manipulate these through passes in After Effects rather than keyframing everything. So. In the camera setup, there's three cameras. Uh, there's these original cameras with the X's beside them. These were just, you know, um, simple linear moves like, like dolly push in, um, you know. And what I did is I just added those um, cameras and added a, gr a grayscale gorilla cam tag and added uh, just some subtle imperfections so they weren't super technical. Like uh, any type of dolly in film, even though it's smooth, it's not perfectly smooth. So these are very subtle. Um, additions. So a um, uh, quick tip, uh, that something that I learned and I've been using Cinema 4D for quite some time and I didn't know that you could do this, but you can um, update all of your HUDs uh, in one fell swoop, uh, which I didn't know, uh, by hitting holding shift. Rather than updating one HUD at a time, um, you can hit Shift V after you've selected all those, and you can add um, whatever parameters you want to see in your heads-up display. I knew you could do it on one, but I didn't know you could do them all at the same time. So if I want to see my total polygon count, um, or let's say my frames on all my uh, HUDs now that they're all selected, just a quality of life thing. Okay, so. The lighting in this scene, so there's my cameras, I explained, but the lighting in the scene, uh, there's six lights. Um, there's an IES light, which is, uh, w sorry, there's lights over the pictures. Uh, there's a light, blue light under the desk. There's a light on the right side. There's light on the left side coming through the window, which is really sharp. Uh, there's a volumetric light coming from inside the bulb. 
So there's a lot of lights, uh, and um, there's also an HDR light. And um, yeah, so what I did was I rendered all this stuff out um, using takes, and you can I can give you a quick overview of the AOVs once I get there. But what the takes actually did for me in the take manager, and I'll just break this out real quick so you can see what's going on here. There's three shots technically and each shot, each take is connected to each camera that I've created so that I can easily um, move through each shot and sync up with each camera. So those takes contain the camera and then those takes also contain the render settings and I've created um, uh, a number of different render settings to uh, accommodate each shot. So the sampling and whatever's inside the render setting is managed by the take. So if you look at my HUD, I've got these my, my takes referenced in my heads up display. So I can always see that my, um, my take is referencing my shot and my shot is referencing or my, and my take is also referencing my uh, render settings. So um, in by doing that, I was able to, um, you know, obviously like a, a, a multi-pass uh, lighting uh, workflow is I would open up my Redshift render settings and in order to render out the AOVs, I would show my AOV manager. And inside of these passes, these are the passes I include, let's say with this opening shot, I would include, you know, a beauty pass. These are all the main passes, but inside these passes, um, I would break out each light pass so that I could use it and kind of manipulate these lights in After Effects. Um, and in doing so, these light passes show up in my Redshift render view so I can preview them and say, okay, these, these are the things that I'm going to get in Cinema 4D. I'm going to get, you know, a light pass from under the desk. I'm going to get my volumetric pass. I'm going to get, you know, my um, uh, overhead lights. I'm going to get my warm right light and then I can assemble these. And I got a crypto map pass, which we can um, possibly dive into later. Um, so that's what I rendered out to After Effects. And um, once I was done that, uh, I assembled everything and I'll take you over to After Effects now um, in order to show you kind of the, the end result of that. So now that we're in After Effects, um, this is the same comp that we saw before um, with all the passes kind of assembled. And the way that this works is I knew I wanted the lights to turn on. Obviously our outside light is turned on, so that's the first thing you see. Um, and then as I animated the passes, uh, these light layers came on and I animated the, um, uh, the emission and the, uh, the beauty of the light bulb and that there's kind of flickered on and I was able to keyframe that and then turn on the, the light behind the LED and then turn on the lights that were on as if, as if this room was coming to life. Uh, and I can manipulate this and offset the timings of things if I wanted to and, and maybe turn on our, our, our desk light earlier, et cetera, et cetera. So as that was happening, um, I, uh, I then was able to uh, composite these passes and I knew that I wanted some kind of additional flickering in on of the side. Um, so I would take my, let's say, well, let's look at this right side light. So that's our, our full right side light and that's just kind of just, it, just there. And then we've got um, an additional duplication of that, which is a right side flicker. And I'm gonna turn off this track mat and basically all this does is it's just flickering. And then I reduce that um, effect just a little bit by creating a track mat above it, a luma mat. And then it's just very, very subtle. You almost can't see it in the preview. But I, d I use this a lot to um, just add a little bit, breathe a little bit of additional life into these scenes. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how all these layers ended up coming back together. And I'll just take you through uh, the stack here. So if we've got our main pass which is our bulb, uh, emiss or a volumetric, we've got our emissive pass, then we've got our desk light, then we've got our overhead IES lights, our right light on the right side, 
and then we got that flicker pass we got a leather light pass and then we've got our window light flicker and we're doing a profile correction and then just some um, uh, grading stuff so that's how I approached this shot all right done with that so next up I'm going to show you how to um, how to uh, do this procedural uh, pic uh, pixel animation using um, pose morphs, effectors, fields, and keyframes. So we'll hop over back over to Cinema. Um, we'll close this. And so I'm in Cinema, and I'm going to. Uh, I've got this this pixel, our main hero pixel animation, and um, what I did here was we've got just a simple spline extruded and it's got some rounding on the radius and this was animated um, there's two states there's a, a, sh a really narrow uh, radius and then the next state was just a rounded radius so there's two states that I've broken out there and then I bake those out into kind of like what I call as an A and B state we want to start from here and we want to end in B so once those are broken out into kind of um, editable states We've got what I call our, our actual hero pixel transformation. And all that's happening here is the corners are moving in at different um, uh, different uh, um, rates, basically. And I'm using fields to do that. And I'll show you how to build that right now. So we'll build it from scratch here. I'm going to uh, remove all the fields to start from, start from nothing. Okay, so we've got a sec here. Okay, we've got our pixel transformation. We've got A and we've got B. And those are uh, kind of just both overlap there. So I'm going to turn off B. I'm going to start with A. And we're going to use our pose morph uh, tag to um, uh, drive the difference between the points uh, points transformation in space. So I want to record or I want to uh, affect points So it's recorded the first pose and that's pose a let's call it. So that's referencing this I'm gonna move my second um, My second state into here. It's gonna ask me. Uh, yes. I want absolute reference uh, So I've got my second pose um, and so now it's taken on that second pose because it's at a hundred percent So I can I can drive this strength value between the two of them just using the pose morph tag but what we want to do is we want the corners not to just kind of turn on and off like that. Um, we want to drive that through fields um, and have them show up on different rates. So I'm just going to drop in a morph deformer. Oops, I'm oh, sorry, not another morph tag. Not a morph deformer. And I'm going to have, um, actually when I do this, I'm just hitting shift C to bring that up. But I'm going to uh, make sure I have A selected. And as I bring in my morph deformer, it's going to automatically, I'm going to move it under here again just for visual reference, but it's, it's referencing the pose morph tag that's here. So now those are connected. So I can, I can drive the um, strength of the second uh, pose using the, the pose, or sorry, the morph deformer. And so what I did then is I didn't want to, again, didn't want everything coming on. So that morph deformer gives me access to fields, which then I can, I'm going to bring the old ones in from the previous one, this replacement. And now I've got these three fields. I'm going to go into my morph deformer and go into the fall off. And I'm going to add these fields that I've created, these box fields, uh, into the morph deformer. And so now uh, what I'd previously done is animated uh, each box field. If I bring up my timeline, you can see in the timeline that uh, these three box fields or these four box fields are all offset in time. Now nothing's happening yet, um, and that's because I need to create uh, these um, these box fields need to occur in a additive uh, state. So oh, let me just see here. So our pose morph. Let me see what's going on. Let me just try that again. Make sure I grab the right ones. So when I bring these back in, we're in the wrong state here, sorry. 
Oh, I missed a critical step here. So if I go back um, to our PoseMorph tag, this uh, is very important. Uh, it needs to be in an animate mode or else it's just kind of kind of be frozen there. So now when I bring in the pose morph tag. Now when I bring in the pose morph tag, this will all work. Oh, sorry, the morph deformer. So we're going to bring in the morph deformer, which is going to reference that pose morph tag. I'm going to add the box fields that I had previously to the morph deformer. Whoops. So I'm going to add these in, and now we're, now we're seeing things come to life. So if I animate this, we only get actually like one of these um, box fields is working, and that's because these fields work like kind of like Photoshop. They have blending modes, so I'm only seeing the um, the effect of the top one. So if I change all these uh, to add or max, uh, it'll just drive the full power of each of these, which again. I've offset in my timeline so that each one animates its strength and effect in a different manner. So I've got more of like an organic kind of like secondary animation, um, which is super helpful. All right, so that's how we got to the transformation on the pixel. And now that's just one pixel. And in our shot, we had a stack of pixels. Um, and I will show you, this is kind of how our shot um, looked in the sequence. Uh, just bear with me. Okay, so this is kind of how our shot looked in the sequence. And these things kind of, they, they kind of were, were floating and, and moving and then their corners just kind of, you know, um, all go to round it and then they fly in and then they kind of like land in in this, this staggered state. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse engineer this so you guys can see how it was built. Um, so once we had our one pixel transformation, I put that inside of a cloner, and that cloner, uh, just bear with me, I'm going to turn this off. I have a vibrate tag that's kind of working in the background, which I need to turn off. Um, so uh, we have this vibrate tag, that's turned off. I'm going to reset my PSR here. All right, so now we have kind of our, our, our basic stack of uh, animated pixels, and they kind of all do the same thing. And they all happen at the same time, and it's kind of boring. So um, I use this formula effector with kind of an equation that uh, Rick Barrett's got a, um, a tutorial on how to kind of um, rotate these at 90 degrees um, and constrain them. So now they're all just they're stacked the same way, but some of them are turned, so they happen in different um, different sequences. The next step is. Uh, ironically a step effector that is being driven by uh, a linear field and that's just separating uh, the clones so that's the that's the first part of the animation and that linear uh, field is right here and that's moving through as these uh, corners round it's moving through and down or up I guess and reducing the effect of the step effector so it's like one part step two okay and then on top of that, after you've added that step effector, I want these things to be scattered to resemble the end state of where they exploded to. So then I've got a, a random effector, which is affecting their um, rotation and position. So it's scattering in space, and they're where kind of I want them to be. And I'm using another uh, linear field here that's kind of moving across the screen. Let me turn off the uh, step effectors field. So you can see, as these are um, floating in space, this linear field can move through after that step effector takes, or before the step effector stops using, or stops working. And these bring, reduce that random effect. So they're reducing the random effect and then reducing the step effect. And then we're getting kind of our, our sequential animation. Um, so the, the next and kind of final step with this um, was Obviously, these things can't just be, you know, the shot can't just go from movement on the previous shot to, like, just frozen in space. So the, um, the vibrate tag, all that was doing is creating some random uh, movement, and that was, uh, that was animated and reduced over time. So they start moving right away. So when I got to this shot, they're f they still feel like they're floating. And then I reduced that down on the amplitude, uh, and then they started their sequence again. And so that's how we got to our uh, final pixel animation, which is fantastic.
Okay, so I'm um, gonna close that and move over to our next um, uh, part of the part of the demonstration here is just uh, this asset customization workflow using uh, Cinema 4D, Redshift, and I'm going to show you a fast, I think, very powerful, easy way to kind of uh, elevate, uh, you know, maybe what you call stock models or you know, quick uh, quick things that you just want to make look better. So, um, all right. So we've got Cinema 4D and on this desk, there was some cats, and these cats, uh, there was some feedback, and we wanted cats to be here, they wanted to be there, they needed to be this texture, to be that texture, so, you know, there needs to be kind of like little Easter eggs uh, scattered throughout this scene. Um, and I wanted these cats, I got them off, uh, I think a turbo squid or something, and ended, ended up, um, uh, they didn't have UVs, they, you know, they, they, there was nothing on them, there was no materials, so I ended up, uh, this is kind of how I, I approach customizing um, 3D assets, uh, you know, because I don't have time all the time to model something from scratch. Uh, there's a lot of better modelers out there. So um, I'm going to take a look here. This is our, I'm just going to render this real quick. So that's kind of like where I ended up with, with this texture. And I'll show you how I got there. So. We're going to start from zero. Again, we've got this cat model. We've got no UVs. So if I go over to my BP UV edit, I've got no UVs. There's nothing there. Um, and using uh, using a Ryzen, Ryzen UV plugin, I'm going to knock this out to Ryzen UV uh, using this little, uh, this little script. And what that's going to do, it's going to bring Ryzen UV, and the reason it's just it's a really fast. There's a lot of algorithms in here that can really kind of like make uh, <laughs> UV unwrapping a lot less pain painful. Um, and so you can see we've got no UV, no UVs, and I can come in here, and I can kind of select my edges and try and do all this, you know. But nobody's got time for that. Like uh, we definitely didn't. So. Instead of me spending time kind of doing a perfect unwrap, I, you know, I wanted to get these over to Substance to kind of a quick and dirty unwrap. So uh, Rhizome has a, a lot of powerful little algorithms. Um, I'm going to use this UV Island uh, algorithm, which is just going to do an automatic unwrap. It's going to un it's going to cut it up. It's going to unwrap it. It's going to pack it. And all I have to do is do this, which is fantastic. So these are my UVs. They're not pretty but they do what i want and because i use that script in cinema you know i don't want to leave cinema in order to go do unwrapping or to go do texture i want cinema to always be plugged in so i can iterate and improve quality fast um, rather than going out to a specific piece of software making adjustments and then coming back in so because i've used that script and i've done a quick unwrap i can hit save and that should bring us back to cinema i've got my uv tag and because that UV tag is there, I can check. And there's all the exact same UVs that I just kicked out from Rhizom. Now that I have these, I can use this in Substance Painter. So I'm going to open Substance Painter. And you're going to see how kind of awesome this is, I think, to be able to kick this out and get what you need in a short amount of time. So. So Substance is firing up. We've got it open. And so the same thing, I've got this bridge uh, that plugs into Substance. Um, using Cinema as our hub, I'm going to knock it out. And it's going to notice that Substance is open. And I've got my model selected with the current UVs. I'm going to hit Send. Uh, I'm going to do a 1K texture. <coughs> and I've sent that. And if I head over to Substance, we've got our cats. And we've got... Uh, are kind of quick and dirty UVs. I'm going to do a quick bake and bake those out. So we'll do this very quick. And we're basically how Substance works, it's going to take the, um, the bake uh, data and it's going to, you know, using smart materials or however you want to do it, you can paint, you know, over top of it. Um, it's going to allow me to use that information 
And let's say I want to, instead of wood, I come back in here and I want to, you know, use this um, uh, metal. I now can use that and it'll take all that information and I can go, you know, maybe customize how much rust I want uh, in here. Oops. And then maybe I don't want as much rust, so I'm just going to, you know... Um, you, uh, turn down the ambient occlusion effect and it's going to reduce the amount of rust that's uh, in the ambient occlusion space. So let's say I like that. I'm like, okay, you know, uh, I'll maybe I'll add one layer uh, just so we can see this in effect. I'm going to paint, you know, um, whatever. So look awesome. White eyed cats. And because I've used that plugin, it's, it's got a, a second part over here, which is, um, it's the substance live link. So it sees that Maxon's, uh, sorry, the Maxon Cinema 4D is open. I'm using Redshift. I'm using a, a legacy uh, um, material. And I want to knock these out at 2K. It's called a default material now, but yeah, you can change that uh, to, let's say, cat metal. And what's fantastic about this is now that this is done, I can hit send. And cat metal material shows up in cinema 4d i've got my entire material um uh in the shader graph here i can uh duplicate my uh or move over my displacement from the uh, previous texture and now that that's done we can see how that looks using redshift render here and i'm going to add those materials see what happens looking pretty good so what's awesome about this is that if we are going back to substance and let's say we're like okay you know what client feedback i'm not sure if we like yellow i'd like to change it to blue i can go down to my properties we can knock out to blue and let's say we don't want rust we just turn off the rust Maybe we want a little bit more dust. We can turn up dust. And we can click update over here. It's going to register that cat metal is still open over here. Um, this might update in here, but either way, I'll just uh, do another render. And there we go. Our cat is blue so i use this i use this in a lot of shots um uh, for a lot of uh, of the models that were in the in the actual shot uh to kind of customize elevate you know just 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 tweak them so you're not actually you know it's, it's just a way to customize your kit bashes if you if you do need to use an asset that you're not starting from scratch or if you don't always have the time so um i used it for the cup you know i used it for uh the the pencil holder i used it for um a lot of things i used it for the baseball um, which is really cool. So, you know, I can quickly show you kind of what those look like um, in here. Like, a okay, so um, I'm going to let substance open again. We should see our baseball. I'll just show you kind of like what, what I was given. And what's great about Substance um, and using this workflow with Cinema 4D is that even if you get like a starting point with like a, a quick asset and you want to customize it, these textures came from the asset and I brought them in to Substance and then all I did was just, you know, add some other layers to them to make it, you know, just for me feel a little bit more real and integrated with the scene. So, um, that's a little bit of how I work uh, and how I approached a lot of these shots, managing scenes, um, you know, managing the workflows, doing a bunch of stuff. And that is it, my friends. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And yeah, if you have any questions, I think, uh, I think we're good. Thanks, Joey. That was great. That was so good. I love that uh, UV texturing workflow, as you know, because I was asking you about it a few days ago. Yep. Painless. Um, Ricard was saying these are some life-changing tips, and I'm sure we all agree. Um, back to your AOVs. Yep. Do you export as, like, individual multi-layer? 
Or are you exporting as like direct? And uh, what's your kind of format of choice? I'm exporting. Uh, those are EXRs. Those are 32 bit, uh, 32 bit EXRs, 16 uh, bit float. Uh, so you get the full dynamic range, and then I'm extracting. Um, I'm extracting the pass out of the EXR that I need. So, yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. So we didn't have too many questions, but if you have any questions for Joey, you know, kind of like let him know on the questions area. Yeah, I mean, I've around. got, I'm sure I've got a thousand questions for <laughs> you for later on. Um, and yeah, don't forget to check him out, Raw and Rendered. He's got his uh, information up here for you guys to see. And yeah, sign up to the 3D Motion Show for, you know, notifications, upcoming shows, all this great stuff that we have going on. And yeah, up next, we have the insanely talented Wimbush. So uh, stick around. What up, what up?